Well, hello there. Welcome to this Sunday School Hour as we finish up with this last lesson, our study on stewardship, the stewardship of life. And uh, thank God for the opportunity to understand what God's given us to do, what he's placed into our hands and our hearts, and what he's going to do through us as we yield to him. It's been quite a great study and many different facets than we've had the opportunity to study before. So I thank God for that. I'm glad that you're here joining with us. And uh, we're praying about all that God is doing. Happy Mother's Day to our ladies out there. And ladies, uh, God has blessed you with children, and you have a wonderful privilege. And may we do all that we can today to encourage mothers and thank God for the mothers that we have, my precious mothers in heaven. I uh, recently, once again, went back by that grave and I, as I was there. Just remember what the Lord said, that one day he's going to come back. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be called up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I want you to be comforted today and thank God for what he's done in your life. And as we get to the Bible lesson this morning on this Mother's Day, may we have no uh, greater topic to study on any Sunday, on any day that God would give us, than our stewardship of the gospel. Our stewardship of the gospel. If you haven't figured it out yet, this is a gospel-centered church. We're trying our best to be. This is our mission. Uh, and the mission that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave him, gave himself gave to God's people before he sent it back to his heavenly Father. And this morning, here for just a few minutes in our Calvary Pearls Sunday School class, and Pearls, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're behaving yourself. I hope everybody's doing all right. How would I ever question you whether you're behaving yourself, right? I, 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 maybe I'll have to check with the 40s and 50s. That group, maybe, maybe the 20s and 30s, but not the Calvary Pearls. De definitely the college and career. We're always checking on them. And these teenagers, well, they're just, they're, they're ranked right at the top of our prayer list. You know that. But I'm glad for the Calvary Pearl Sunday School class. There are others, I'm sure, watching this lesson on this day. Uh, but our greatest resource is not our fellowship, even though we have a good time doing that. Our greatest resource is the Bible. And so let's have a word of prayer and gather our Bible and ask God to help us for this Sunday School hour as we study one more time this an area of stewardship, most importantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you've done in bringing us through to this point. You've been so faithful to us. Our church has been so faithful to you. And Lord, how grateful I am. And I'm sure others are to be a part of a church like this. This is not our work. It's yours. You're leading it. You're holding it together. You're moving us ahead. And we praise you for it. I pray you bless this study of stewardship as we understand stewardship of the gospel. Thank you for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the impact it's made on my life and the life of those hearing my voice, no doubt, and on the lives of those that we can come in contact with and those that we can witness to and those that we can help get the gospel to. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you look with me in God's word, there's several uh, areas in the gospel records where you'll find the gospel of Jesus Christ or information about the gospel. But this lesson, we're going to take Mark 16, 15, and then take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you'd like to find those two passages, that would be great. If you'd like to find those two passages, again, I hope that you'll uh, be with us in our drive-in service here on Mother's Day. Things cool down a little bit this weekend, but we're looking for a beautiful day together on the parking lot, honoring our mothers with flowers and special recognition that we have for mothers. And we're going to do that and look forward to all of it. But before we get to that, let's study God's word here. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, there's a familiar passage where the Lord it says here, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, we have the privilege of made, making this emphasis in our World Mission Conference recently. Uh, but I don't want you to just overlook this now. There may be some familiarity. But may God open our heart to new avenues of understanding about our stewardship of the gospel as we study. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm glad that Christ died for every man, tastes the death for every person. We can't witness to the wrong person, and the gospel is strong enough to save everybody, to save everybody. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3 and 4. If you'd like to find your place there with me for a few moments. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4. Paul writes here in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, there to the church in Corinth. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He died, he was buried. We should not overlook the fact that he was buried and that he rose again and all that according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. My friend, we have no greater uh, trust than we have of the gospel. Recently, I spoke from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 about being put in trust with the gospel. We have a stewardship of the gospel. Therefore, we are to speak. And may God help us and reveal this to us. As we get into our lesson that's been provided for us, I appreciate this series of lessons here. It takes an emphasis immediately to the year 1956. Uh, some of you remember 1956 well. That was before I discovered America, before I came on the scene, just a few years. But what was going on in 1956? Dwight D. Eisenhower had been reelected the president of the United States of America. How about that? General Dwight Eisenhower, now that had been reelected as the president, there was a Soviet leader named, named Nikolai Khrushchev, who, had, interestingly enough, had denounced uh, Joseph Stalin. He began to de Stalinize, the de Stalinization of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. Yeah, that's a thing of the past. Most of us grew up understanding that. Many young people today uh, don't, don't know much about that. 1956, Israel invaded the Sinai Peninsula. Congress approved the, approved the Highway Act to construct the United States Interstate Highway System so you can fly up and down the roads, right? Uh, Fidel Castro started a revolution in, in Cuba. The first transatlantic telephone uh, cable entered operation. So much going on. There was an oral polio vaccine. Our lesson reminds us that the New York Yankees defeated the Brooklyn Dodgers in the World Series. And the Olympic Games were being held in Melbourne, Australia. But 1956 was also an important time for the sake of the gospel. There were a group of people, an isolated group of semi-nomadic people living in Ecuador. Hostile people, fearsome people. People that were also fearful of others. Uh, they would uh, kill an outsider very quickly and had been known to do that. In fact, they murdered each other as well. Very hostile tribe. But this group of Indians became known as what well, we know, the Aka Indians. That name, Aka, means savages. And uh, they looked at outsiders as savages and cannibals, and they weren't interested in outs outsiders at all. They didn't seem too interested in their insiders because they had such a high rate of homicide among their people. But into that territory went people that you may be familiar with, a man named Jim Elliott, another missionary as well, Nate Saint, Peter Fleming, Ed McCulley and Roger Udarian, they wanted to bring the gospel to the Aka Indians in Ecuador in what they called Operation Aka, as they sought to go about that. What they did is they were able to fly in, and from the air they dropped gifts by rope to indicate to, the, to those villagers, that the Aka Indians, that, that the missionaries had a friendly intention, and they did several gift drops. And then the Aukas returned the gift by taking the rope as it was it was given down from the, from the plane that was, things were dropped from. They tied their own gifts to that rope and sent them back up to the missionaries. How about that? The missionaries took that as a, an act of favor, and so they, they finally landed their plane on the beach there in Ecuador, about six miles from the village, the Indian village of the Alka Indians, and made their first face-to-face -face contact with the Alkas here in 1956. While all these other amazing things are going on in the world, these men, these young men, had committed themselves to the gospel, to this, this very difficult tribe. The encounter, though, seemed favorable. They seemed like they were happy to see the missionaries, and certainly the missionaries were happy to see them. And so the men, these, these five <coughs> excuse me, missionaries, they decided to set up camp there on the beach, which they called Palm Beach. And the following morning, they were greeted again by the Alka Indians, but this time... Uh, they weren't greeted in a warm fashion. This time, a large group of Indians arrived bearing spears, and all five missionaries were brutally killed. Brutally killed. In fact, so in such a difficult way, they had a difficult time identifying their bodies. They could only identify them by watches and rings and pocket journals. These five young men, their future ahead of them, bright, their lives snuffed out so quickly. In fact, their deaths made the national news. Uh, why, why would they waste their lives? And maybe, maybe millions of people shook their heads in disbelief and pity about young men who are so capable stepping out into eternity. Interestingly enough, Jim Elliott, 
as we identify uh, most prominently in this group, had written something six and a half years earlier that, that maybe gave us a clue to what he was thinking and what God had put in his heart. He wrote this in his own journal, October the 28th, 1949. Six years, six and a half years before uh, he, his life was ended by the Alka Indians, he said this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. How about that? No fool to give what he give, who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Uh, he knew his life was not his own. <laughs> and history proves Jim Elliott right. You know what? Less than three years after that Palm Beach massacre, after the Alka's brutally murdered and took the lives of those five dedicated young missionaries, the Alka's allowed two missionaries, actually the sister and the wife, of two of the men that they had murdered it allowed those ladies to come back and live among them. How about those ladies' courage for God? And you know what happened because of that? Thousands of the Alkas trusted Christ as their Savior. They established local churches. In fact, they even, as they came to know the Lord, surrendered to go and take the gospel to neighboring Indian tribes. <laughs> the missionary sacrifice taught the people that the gospel is worth the complete investment of someone's life. That's remarkable, isn't it? That's remarkable. You know, we have to admit that the most important gift God ever brings into the lives of any person, into the life of any person, and certainly into my life, is the truth of the gospel concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 and verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Thank God for the truth that Jesus came to make clear. Mark chapter 8 and verse 35 for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. As we begin this last lesson on the steward stewardship of life, we should actively steward all of our resources, including our life itself, into eternity for the sake of people who need to know the Lord and for the sake of the gospel. May God help us to understand that as we study stewarding the gospel. Number one, notice this, that his command, our Lord's command, is our priority. The Lord's command is our priority. When Christ left this earth after his resurrection, and as he left there from the Mount of Olives and ascended to be back with his father, he gave a final command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And Christ left a final command. And may God help us to make much of that final command. You know, final words are very important. Final words are very important, and that's what Christ left us here to do is take this gospel as we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Christ came to earth to give us this gospel and to give us a command to take the gospel. May that command be our first priority. Luke chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. Luke chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. This is the heart of our God for reaching people. And stewarding the gospel requires that we steward our lives for the purpose of leading souls to Christ. So we understand, first of all, that his command is our priority. May God help us to make his command our priority. Secondly, the gospel is a trust. The gospel is a trust. I mean, we have a stewardship. The gospel is more than facts. It's a treasure. It's absolutely a treasure that's been committed to our trust. Our lesson gives us the example of football. Some of you enjoy football. Maybe some have played football. If you're a football player, you might think the most important possession during a game was the football. And you have the, the opportunity to receive the ball or intercept a pass. You would run and do everything you can with that ball to get toward the goal line, protecting it from the other team. You know, when God has committed the gospel to our trust, he's commanded us to take it to the world, but sometimes like a football player that's not careful, we fumble the ball. Fumble! We fumble the ball. What chaos that creates. And many Christians are today are fumbling in, fumbling the Great Commission, fumbling in what God gave us to do. And, uh, you know, we might uh, get worked up about a fumble at a football game, <laughs> scream and holler about all of that. But how seriously are we taking our responsibility to carry the gospel into all the world? Uh, again, I mentioned First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, but as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, allowed of God, approved of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth their hearts. You know, the gospel is our stewardship. It's our responsibility. Somewhere along the line, especially among American Christians, we, we've gotten the idea that maybe this is a preacher's job or 
someone who's in the full-time Christian ministry. Uh, but it's not. The, the, the verses that were written that I've been reading to you were written not to a pastor, not to a preacher, but they were written to every member of a church. Written to every member of a church. We're all entrusted with the precious truth of salvation. And God gives us so much to be thankful for, you know, in our lives. So we're so blessed in America. Sometimes we're so blessed, we're, we're, we're so distracted. We get so excited about things that God does for us, and he has been good to us. Thank God for it. But our, our excitement about things should, should, should really, our, our really, our great excitement, and we should be excited about what God does. Don't get me wrong. But our greatest excitement should come from that which initiates the cheers of heaven. Do you know there's rejoicing in heaven when people come to Christ? Yeah, Luke 15, 10 is where we get that instruction. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So you want to have a, hear, hear a lot of cheering in heaven? We want to see people, we want to help people come to Christ on this earth. That's what heaven gets excited about. How about us on earth? May we say, as in heaven in this regard, so in earth. May it be that way here. Oh, thank God for that. Do you remember when you were saved? For some time now, we've been encouraging people to consider and to write down and record, even by video, their own salvation testimony. I'd encourage you to do that and, and to let people know how you came to Christ, maybe who led you to Christ. But thank God for that. Don't forget, don't, don't, don't forget the day you were saved. And I tell you, I don't think you can. <laughs> And uh, it's, it brings an excitement in your heart. We ought to want that for every person. So as we think about this lesson that we have for this hour in stewarding the gospel of Jesus Christ, we see, first of all, that his command is our priority. The last words he said on this earth, we're going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We understand that this gospel then is a trust. It's been committed unto us. Very precious truth been handed to us and may we be excited about that and may we put that at the center of all that we are as a believer in the center of all that we are especially as a local church we are the pillar and ground of that truth and may god help us to remember that but we want to understand as well thirdly then that soul winning thirdly soul winning is an investment soul winning is an investment if you'll turn with me in the book of proverbs chapter 11 Proverbs chapter 11, and I, as I mentioned the word Proverbs, I hope that you're trying to read a proverb a day. I encourage you last month uh, to read uh, five psalms a day and a proverb a day. I, I think you should stay on that. But last month I made greater emphasis on the psalms of my own life. This month I'm making a greater emphasis on the Proverbs. I felt like, you know, we, as things have been unsettled and unsure, we needed some comfort, some help. And now as we move ahead, we need some wisdom. Amen? And we'll find it in God's Word. In Proverbs chapter 11, Proverbs chapter 11 says here in verse 30, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Soul winning is an investment. Here in the book of Proverbs, we see that, that directive given. God points out truly uh, what, what truly wise stewardship looks like as we think about the gospel in relationship to our life. He that winneth souls is wise. Think about with me, first of all, that wise investment, that wise investment. You know, regardless of your, your area of employment, you may call it a profession, you may call it a career, but you can choose to be a soul winner. God help us. God help us. Uh, what is a soul winner? It's just someone that helps leads, pe leads people to Christ. Uh, someone that helps lead people to Christ. We all have that command to be a witness I, I tell you, we all ought to obey that command. I've run across some people in my life where I thought, boy, these people have, have a gift. We all have a command, but it does seem that at times some people have a gift uh, for, for being able to lead people to Christ. But whether we consider ourselves to have the gift or not, we cannot excuse the fact that we have a command to follow. But soul winning is, first of all, a very wise investment. Regardless of your profession, you've been commanded to lead souls to Christ you know, as a Christian, as we steward the gospel, with no doubt you're going to have many opportunities to share the gospel with others. You're going to do that. You know, we ought to do it at least weekly. We ought to, we ought to purposefully, purposefully carve out time in our schedule to share the gospel with other people. If you're a believer and you're going to steward the gospel, then you ought to have a set-aside time that you do that. I highly recommend, our lesson recommends this, to try to, try to follow along what we do in our church. We, we offer opportunities on Thursday morning. Now, we're out of that schedule right now as we wait for things to come back together, but we offer opportunities on Thursday morning. More of you ought to take advantage of that.
you have that time in your schedule. We offer opportunities on Thursday evening. And as we get the opportunity to open things back up, more of you ought to be a part of that. As you steward the gospel, we offer opportunities on Saturday morning as well. And I want you to know, if you're really going to be take, if you're going to take stewarding the gospel seriously, you're going to carve out time to share the gospel. I like those carved out times because certainly we'll talk about a moment in, in giving the gospel as we go and as we live and the divine appointments that we have. But it helps me to dedicate time to it, uh, dedicate time to it. And we ought to be dedicating time to the gospel. And if God's put you in this church, you ought to seriously consider being a part of those times that we've set aside as a church to do these things together. And uh, I remember there was a day and time when we only had one opportunity a week that we organized. Now we're opportunity, have an opportunity for three of those times. And so I hope that you'll take advantage of it. So schedule the time. If you're going to make a wise investment, you ought to schedule it. You ought to do it on purpose. And your, your schedule will reveal your priorities. Yes, it will. Your schedule reveals your priorities. And so God help us with that. There are other times. Opportunities will come through God's providence, and we ought to be ready to be a witness. We'll talk about that in a moment. Well, you never know the spiritual condition or needs of, of, of another person's life, and so we ought to be ready to be a faithful steward of the gospel. Faithful steward of the gospel. I'm glad someone was a faithful steward of the gospel in my life. Many people were. My own parents, Sunday school teachers, and others. Our lesson gives us the illustration of, of evangelist D.L. Moody. Uh, Moody was a great evangelist of the 1800s. He trusted Christ at 17 years of age. Why is that? Because his Sunday school teacher, Mr. Edward Kimball, thought it was his duty to make sure that every person in his Sunday school class heard the gospel uh, personally. Our lesson says this one Sunday, uh, it says here about, about D.L. Moody, he went to Sunday school and he was led to a class taught by Mr. Edward Kimball. Mr. Kimball handed Dwight a Bible and told him that the lesson was in John and he watched Dwight skim the table of contents for the book of John and finally gave him his own open Bible from which to read. I think God used that to burden Kimball's heart for D.L. Moody. Imagine handing the young man a Bible and he couldn't even find the book in there. There are a lot of people like that in this world. The longer we live, the fewer people are familiar with the book. Fewer people familiar with the book. That's true. Campbell wasn't content just to teach the class on Sunday. Listen up, Sunday school teachers. Listen up. Listen up, those working with our children, our adults. Listen up, those working with our master clubbers. Listen up. Mr. Campbell wasn't content just to teach a class on Sunday. May you not be content. May I not be content. But he visited his class members during the week. And one week he resolved to go to the shoe store while Mr. Moody was working. Speak to him about eternity. As he started toward the shoe store, he began to second guess himself. Boy, I've been there. I don't know about you. He didn't know if he should be visiting there in the place of his employment. He didn't want to embarrass him. He, he, didn't, and he wanted to give the other clerks occasion to make fun of him or Mr. Moody. He was thinking all that through. Mr. Kimball passed the shoe store without noticing it. When he realized what he had done, he decided just to make a dash for it and have it over at once. He said, I'm here. I just need to do it. I just need to do it. There's a battle. Witnessing for Christ that we have to battle ourself, battle our pride, battle our fear. God help me. He darted in. He found Dwight in the back of the store. He went to him. He put his hand up on his shoulder. He placed his foot on a shoebox. There he gave what he estimated as a week. He estimated as a weak presentation of the gospel. But he told Dwight of Christ's love for him and invited him to trust Christ. Dale Moody was ready for the light. And right there he trusted Jesus as his Savior. Both Moody and Mr. Kimball were thankful that Mr. Kimball followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And may we do the same and follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit and witness to everyone under our sphere of influence. Thank God for a Sunday school teacher. Thank God for a Bible teacher that took interest in someone's life and felt it was his duty, his duty to take care of witnessing to, the, to his, his student in his class. Listen, as we think about soul winning, it's a wise investment. He that wins souls is wise. It's a fruitful investment. As before Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven, he promised this, what? That the Holy Spirit would enable us to be witnesses for Christ. We can't do that in the power of our flesh. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When we faithfully witness for Christ, the Holy Spirit uses our efforts 
use those efforts to convict people of their need for salvation. I'm glad the Holy Spirit's working. I'm a poor witness at times, but God is faithful. It says of this of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And listen, we call ourselves soul winners, but we're just the witness. Literally, it's the Holy Spirit that wins people, but he allows us the joy of being used in the process. And we understand that if we will uh, use our stewardship wisely, uh, we can be the soul winner God wants us to be. But we don't do it by accident. You must be effective in your stewardship. How can you be effective? The lesson gives us several tips. Number one, to be an effective steward of the gospel, we ought to pray for a burden. You know, every person is born with an eternal soul. They'll live somewhere for eternity. They'll live in heaven or hell. God give us a burden to see people in heaven. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God help us to stand in the way of people being cast in the lake of fire. God help us. God help us to have a burden. You say, I don't have a burden. You're like me sometimes. I don't have a burden for everybody I walk by and see. I do not like I ought to. But you know what I can do is I can pray for it. I can pray for it. Pray that I have a burden for people. You know, in the rush of busy schedules, we forget that every person has an eternal soul. That person in the line at the grocery store, that person and when you're getting fuel at the gas station, that person across from you is either going to heaven or going to hell. And we know the gospel. We must help them with that. We must help them with that. May we have the heart of Christ. By the way, he was the greatest soul winner ever. May our heart overflow with compassion like Jesus' heart flowed, overflow with compassion for the lost. Matthew 9 and verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd God changed the way I look at the masses and the people that need the Lord. You know what else we can do? We pray for a burden. We also should carry gospel tracts. Get ourselves ready. Carry the truth of the gospel on your person, in your purse, in your pocket. I recommend you carry a nice gospel tract. Be careful about just having it all crumpled up and all wrinkled up. The gospel is powerful enough to deal with that, but I think we ought to give a nice piece of gospel literature to people that will point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We already said not only uh, praying and carrying gospel tracts, we should schedule a time for soul winning. And I wholeheartedly endorse the times that we have scheduled as a church, <laughs> as you can imagine the pastor would. But it will help you to have those committed times. Again, your schedule reveals your priority. And if we don't block off time for soul winning on the calendar, we'll never have time. And God help us to get to these weekly meetings when we have the opportunity to do it again, to see people saved and given the gospel. You know what else we should do? If we pray for a burden, the lesson says, we should carry gospel tracts, schedule time. We should keep an updated prospect list. Very few people do this. Very few people do this. I can think of some friends. They're so faithful in this way. But they maintain an active soul winning prospect list with the names and addresses of people you met or people that show an interest in the Lord's church or an interest in knowing Christ. And you follow up on that list and pray and actively pursue people in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And it'll be amazed, you'll be amazed to see what God does. If you keep an updated, updated list and keep it carefully updated, you'll, you'll see how tenacious you are in following up on prospects or may, maybe how tenacious we aren't at times. May God help us in that regard. If, we're, if we want to have a steward, we want to be a, a good steward of it. And then, you know what else? Someone who wants to be a, a good steward of the gospel is, again, praying for a burden, carrying tracks, scheduling time, keeping a list. As, listen to this one. Attentive in the church services. Ready to help a visitor in a church service trust Christ. We need more of that at Calvary Baptist Church. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about this, but when the preacher says at the invitation time, bow your head and close your eyes, that's when an, a person who wants to see somebody saved keeps their eyes open. I let the secret out of the bag. Did you know some people keep their eyes open when the preacher says that? You know who those people are? The people that want to see somebody get saved. They want to help somebody get saved. Often, sometimes I'll stand here in this pulpit looking for somebody to help me with somebody. <laughs> And you're doing what I told you to do. You close your bow, your head, and close your eyes. I guess I have nobody to blame it on but myself. But there are a few people I can always find because they're interested. They're interested in seeing someone come to Christ. Let's be attentive. And so it's not just during those times, but you're also looking around, meeting people as they come in the door and working to ask them about their relationship with Christ while you have the opportunity. 
Be attentive in the church services. By the way, you can also demonstrate hospitality. Uh, we love to see people hear the gospel once and trust Christ, but oftentimes it takes effort and, and, and multiple times together. And people who open their home and spend time with other people, the, the, that hospitality can be used for the Lord to help see pe people come to Christ. It certainly is a necessary ingredient in discipleship, but it also can, can be used in winning people to Christ. As we think about some uh, tips that we have here, I keep reviewing them so you remember them, praying for a burden carrying gospel tracts, scheduling a time, keeping an updated prospect list, attentive in the church services, demonstrating hospitality. One more thing, that we involve new converts in soul winning. Yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to pass off that gift, not pass it off, but make sure they catch, catch it. If we've got that virus, excuse me, of soul winning, they can catch that too. Maybe they'll catch the fever, so to speak. Uh, maybe not the funniest joke in this day and age, but that's the truth. We're trying to, I hope it's contagious. hope it's contagious. But fruitful soul winners encourage new converts to reach their unsaved friends. And may God help us to do that and, and help us to disciple folks and bring them alone, along for the cause of Christ. You know, we work at it, but only the Holy Spirit can convict hearts. But he uses us. Thank God he uses us. John chapter 16, speaking of the work of the Holy Spirit again in, in verse 8 and 9. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, uh, of sin because they believe not on me. The gospel is a trust. It's our responsibility to invest our life, to invest our resources in delivering the precious, eternal, life-giving message and life-changing message of the gospel. We have a stewardship. Thank you for investing financially in the gospel and the World Mission Conference. Thank you. This is our duty. We ought to do that. But thank you for extending that and going beyond. May God help us to ever progress there. Ever progress there. Make progress in what we've been given to do. And stewarding our life for the sake of the gospel is an opportunity. It's not a sacrifice. David Livingston, the Scottish missionary explorer, spent 33 years in Africa, in the heart of Africa, suffering as he labored to spread the gospel, working to open that continent to missionaries. Many there today can thank David Livingston for that. He said this, people talk of sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be a call to sacrifice, which is simply acknowledging a great debt we owe to our God, which we can never repay? It is emphatically no sacrifice. Rather, it is a privilege, anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger, foregoing the common, common conveniences of this life, these may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink, but let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing compared with the glory which shall later be revealed in and through us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not talk. This is what Livingston said. When we rem we have this we ought not talk. When we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. Again, stewarding ourselves for the sake of the gospel, it's, not a, it's an opportunity, not a sacrifice. It's a joy, not a burden. It's an investment, not a loss. And may God help us to steward our life that way. Steward our life that way according to the gospel. I close with 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, Moreover, is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, stewarding the mysteries of God, the opening of the gospel to the whole world. That is our privilege. It's our opportunity. Our lesson says this, stewarding the gospel is the funnel point of stewardship. It is the compelling motivator for stewarding every other area of life with wisdom and balance. Thank God for your desire to steward your finances and your time but may God help us to value this gospel and realize this really is the starting point for our life of stewardship is how we treat the truth of the death, burial, and, Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our own eternal life and for the hope of eternal life for all those that we have an opportunity to witness to. Let's pray and commit this to the Lord. I hope you'll join your heart with mine and saying, God, help me. God, help me to be a much, much better steward of this gospel. All this world needs it.
This world needs it. Father, thank you for the truth of the gospel that's reached me, and may I be a channel of blessing to get this truth to others. Help me to understand that I'm stewarding the gospel. Oh, I can't even believe this precious trust has been given to me. I pray for our church that we would carefully, but we would energetically steward the gospel to see this truth reach the world from our church and do our best to obey your great command. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. I look forward to seeing you here in just a little while as we celebrate Mother's Day together with a drive-in service at 11 a.m.